Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I have a video I wanted to do on political Gnosticism. And it's interesting because I hadn't really considered Gnosticism in the political sense. I had only considered it in the sort of occultish um, Christian heresy sense. <laughs> And uh, I think it's interesting to look at it through the political lens, though. And I'd come across an article that, um, that sparked that uh, while looking at a couple other articles. Um, the first thing that I noticed, uh, the first article I came to, um, was this article here. Um, this is from Arctos. This is by Richard Story modern statism as western gnosticism so he has two parts to this and um he recently uh published a sort of uh response article to a video keith woods made about is the left a gnostic death cult uh, where keith woods argued that he didn't think it was because he sees the left as sort of very materialistic and lacking sort of tele teleological and theological underpinnings you know and i thought that mr woods made some good points however i think that the left actually is not materialistic in recent years i think they're moving as they go into transhumanism more and more that they do kind of create this sort of gnostic utopian vision so i kind of wanted to explore that i thought you guys might find it interesting we're not going to read all of this but i will include the links to this stuff in the um video description so this first article is from october of 2018 it begins, the birth of the modern state, with all its willful irresponsibility and elitism, can be traced back to the historical development of Gnosticism and the esoteric societies connected to it. This article by the author and up-and-coming Arctos title, The Uniqueness of Western Law, a reactionary manifesto, explores an important thesis asserted by Professor Frank Van Dunn that, in the past millennium at least, underlying tensions between fundamentally Catholic and Gnostic paradigms in the Western mind have manifested the two clashing schools of Western jurisprudence, natural law and legal positivism. This article further provides a supplementary thesis. These competing mindsets might ultimately be manifestations of disparate psychologies seeking either greater or lesser responsibility, particularly regarding the exercise of reason and their decision-making and other actions. As such, Western Gnosticism posits a deterministic worldview, with the modern state as an imminent, positivistic conduit of societal destiny. It is super interesting. Quote, Modern positivism draws its zeal from the conviction that there is and can be no order among humans that is not itself a product of the power of the human imagination, that is to say, the imagination of the enlightened few, the intellectuals who know, and their power to impose it on the unenlightened many, the ordinary mortals who get by on belief. This is different from the old Hobbesian position that there can be no order in the world because everybody seeks power and consequently will be involved in a war of all against all until someone decisively wins that war. Rather than merely averting the war of all against all, which is the universal bad, political power should restore human dignity, quote unquote, by liberating humanity from the baleful consequences of its nature and its history. That liberation is supposed to be the universal good. To seek it is the hallmark of the progressive mind, the revolt against and liberation from history and nature, which is the original motive of the religious movement called Gnosticism, unquote, Frank Van Dunn. So, it begins its introduction. According to Professor Henrik Bogdan, during the Renaissance, there was a 
distinct syncretism occurring across Europe between the traditions of Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, and the Jewish Kabbalah, resulting in the emergence of what is referred to as Western esotericism. This term is, of course, a scholarly construct developed in large part by the prominent French scholar Professor Antoine Favre for the purpose of studying the commonality between these currents. More recent scholars, such as Professor Arthur Verse Lewis, would just as readily title the subject Western Gnosticism due to the more general, overarching beliefs of groups who lay claim to superior cosmological insight. I will use the two, the two terms interchangeably hereafter. This Western Gnosticism was preserved in esoteric groups during the period of medieval Christendom, a time of essentially uniform belief across Europe and into the modern period. Professor Kukko von Stockrad, as yet the foremost scholar on the subject, has suggested that Favre's taxonomy is ideal for understanding the development of this esotericism in the early modern period but his own work reaches further to the ancient and classical worlds to garner a richer perspective on the influences at play before, during, and well beyond the Renaissance, from the Rosicrucians and Freemasonry of uh, early modernity to Carl Jung, Julius Evola, the New Age movement, and other 20th century reverberations. And I think that's absolutely accurate. There is Gnosticism woven throughout all of that especially the new age movement good lord <laughs> and even progressivism in general the idea that like only the progressive can bring down like this utopian heaven on earth but we never get there it's just a constant like a constant uh what do they call it a continuous revolution and so they always have to be in power because they're the special boys, the only people that can bring about this utopia that will never happen. From this broader historical perspective, Stockrad is able to propose a more scholarly framework of analyses in which he identifies the pivotal point of all esoteric traditions as twofold. One, claims to real or absolute knowledge, and two, the means of making this knowledge available. This might be through an individual ascent as in Gnostic or Neoplatonic texts or through an initiatory event, as in secret societies of the modern period. Stuckrad notes that this supposed higher knowledge or wisdom that is superior to other interpretations of cosmos and history is perceived by its bearers as a master key for answering all questions of humankind. Immediately, we can see the similarity between the mindset of the elitist esoteric inner circle, those distinguished persons and sages, as Stuckrad identifies them, who really know what is best for you and me, and those who occupy state offices and exercise they raise on detra on behalf of the citizens. This inescapable similarity is not so superficial, as we shall see. Indeed, they are, of course, the modern priest class. <laughs> We can also identify the denial of the doctrine of free will as essential to Western Gnosticism, if not explicitly, then at least in the assertion of the Semitic or nominalist view of God, or simply a voluntarist, essentially positivist view of law. In this way, it contradicts natural law and denies a natural order of the world, especially the human world, necessitating an artificial order posited by an elite body of enlightened ones. Yes, exactly. Lord have mercy. We shall now explore this assertion by following Stuckrad's broader perspective of the development of Western Gnosticism into antiquity. So you can read the rest of this for yourself. It is very, very interesting from Neoplatonism and Kabbalism to modern statism. And it continues on. Uh, this is very, very interesting, very good reading. And I suggest y'all check it out. Um, yeah, it's just really... They, it makes some really good arguments here. And I do think that there is a lot of Gnostic 
a lot of Gnostic thought in the uh, the modern left, of course. I mean, I think that that's obvious. Um, okay, so he followed this up with a part two. Modern statism is Western Gnosticism part two. The Western Gnostic rejection of natural order underpins legal positivism, the abandonment of Christianity, and the rise of the totalitarian states of the 20th and increasingly the 21st century. Yes, exactly. According to Van Dunn, Orthodox Christianity, uh, so this is from Calvinism to Communism, which sanctified human free will and the natural order of the human world with respect to it, historically conf conflicted with Gnostic beliefs regarding the nature, or rather, the essence of man and of the natural world. Yes, because Gnosticism is a her <laughs> it's heresy. These conflicting beliefs, in turn, gave rise to modern positivism, and more specifically, what he calls the ideology, quote-unquote, of legal positivism as a competing school of Western jurisprudence. More recently, Professor John Gray, in his treatise on the subject of free will, unknowingly agrees with Van Dunn, yet no one can accuse him of having a Catholic axe to grind, Gray being an atheist, quote, Throughout much of the world, and particularly in Western countries, the Gnostic faith that knowledge can give humans a freedom no other creature can possess has become the predominant religion. Believing that human beings can be fully understood in terms of scientific materialism, they reject any idea of free will, but they cannot give up hope of being masters of their destiny. <laughs> this is so true. So they have come to believe that science will somehow enable the human mind to escape the limitations that shape its natural condition. To be free, humans must revolt against the laws that govern earthly things. We see this in many modern forms of leftism, not just transhumanism, but um, in promoting things like pride and... Uh, transism <laughs> you know what i'm talking about guys the dream of finding freedom by rebelling against cosmic law has reappeared as the belief that humans can somehow make themselves master masters of nature well this is the communist war against the heavens you know that is what karl marx literally said himself that he was at war with what he called the big guy upstairs so, yes, this underpins all of leftism. Of course, the suggestion that modernism is essentially Gnostic is not new. The political philosopher Eric Vogelin outlined as much in his best-known works, and we're going to get to that in a minute. He even identified a historical continuity and experiential equivalence between the ancient movements discussed above and modern positivism, including Marxism, Freudianism, progressivism, and its other ideological subcategories. For Vogelin, modern positivism was typified by two characteristics. One, a particular group's feeling of alienation from the supposedly disorderly or even evil world or society at large which then evokes a belief in the elitism of that group due to their ability to transcend the disorder through their gnostic speculation their extraordinary insight and in learning i.e gnosis <clears throat> william blake and two their desire or attempts to impose or implement the alienated group's solutions, even coercively, to establish their heaven on earth, to immunitize the eschaton. These characteristics cement not just far-left or right political regimes as Gnostic, but all modern statism built as it is on legal positivism. An elite political class is proposed, one which can act with impunity in the establishment of an idealized, necessary, artificial order, the modern Leviathan state apparatus. Oh, I agree with this wholeheartedly. 
Indeed, Vogelin's criteria seem but a politicized version of Stuckrad's criteria of Western Gnosticism as claims to real knowledge and the means of making this knowledge available. This is the political meaning of progress, according to Vogelin, quote, all Gnostic movements are involved in the project of abolishing the constitution of being with its origin and divine transcendent being and replacing it with a world imminent order of being, the perfection of which lies in the realm of human action. This is a matter of so altering the structure of the world, which is perceived as inadequate, that a new satisfying world arises yeah the utopia unquote a great exponent of vogelin's philosophy professor michael henry has summarized it similarly quote positivism is another variety of gnosticism through its reduction of reality to the imminent with legal positivism contracting the truth of order to convention or statute unquote henry builds on vogelin to advance a dictomy in the western psyche the transcendence oriented amor day and its antithesis the egoistic amor sui the latter comports with Gray's view of Gnostic modernism as it defines goodness primarily in terms of what we can control within the bounds of an inherently meaningless material universe. Um, yeah, consider the, the Matrix movies in the mindset of the Gnostic. It will, you'll see it differently. Gnosticism emerged and emerges as a reaction to Christianity's denial of human fulfillment and material satisfaction. It thus makes humanity the locus of the divine and seeks an imminent salvation through human action, quote, which can be attained only by pretending to satisfy the soul's innate hunger for immortality and transcendence with an endless stream of uh, ephemeral gratifications. Yeah, exactly. Pleasure seeking. <laughs> Hedonism. As far as positivism is concerned, an artificial order is not simply needed but welcomed in the Gnostic mindset. Vogelin describes modern statism quite graphically, perhaps hinting at the French Revolution. Quote, in order, therefore, that the attempt to create a new world, hmm, a new world order may seem to make sense the givenness of the order of being must be obliterated the order of being must be interpreted rather as essentially under man's control and taking control of being further requires that the transcendent origin of being be obliterated it requires the decapitation of being essentially the murder of god unquote so you know, when we've talked about before, the modern liberal being at war with the natural world and at war with God, this is what we're referring to. That is literally what they think, even if they don't understand it consciously, that is, that is, it underlies all of their beliefs, is their hatred for God and their desire to either become God or overthrow God and institute their own so-called heaven on earth. Henry's valuable contribution is found in his cogent presentation of this dictum in Western civilization in terms of the psychology at work. Quote, the meaning of Vogelin's succinct formulation becomes clearer if we note that it is the reverse of the Christian discernment that the death of the ego is the price of spiritual growth in faith. Exactly. The origin of the fall into Gnosticism he found in Christianity's realization that the soul must be ordered through humble openness to transcendence and the tension and uncertainty of faith, rather than masterfully grasping it with the security of knowledge. The spiritually impotent ego pursuing worldly dominance and the illusory power of certainty, while rejecting the genuine substance of order, is what Vogelin meant by the revolt of Western society against God, unquote. Yes, and their, that is, their belief system is do what thou will, right? That is them thinking that they can, by using the will to power, transcend and overcome the natural order and the limitations imposed by <laughs> the, the natural law. It's amazing.
And this is, of course, how they think the technology will help them with this. And it's really interesting in another sense because we've, uh, on this show, at times talked about the connection between sort of technology and the occult and where did where did this technology come from? How is it, how is it advanced so quickly? And we've talked about sort of just things like, you know, the your phone, right? For example, your phone being a black mirror, just like John D and Edward Kelly's scrying mirror for how they contacted uh, beings they called the macrobes, which we know were demons that they were talking to. These entities claimed to be angels and gave them Enochian magic. And so <laughs> this is how I think that, you know, and many other Christians believe that they're getting technology. It is through contacting and channeling demonic entities. These demonic entities are giving them technology. And that actually goes back to, um, you know, the fall of Lucifer and these fallen angels teaching humanity how to, you know, put on makeup and, and forge weapons and things like that. It is not actually new. It's not a new thing at all. And I find that just really creepy. <laughs> okay, continuing. But where and how did this revolt begin? Vogelin diagnosed the Gnostic nature of modernity as the classical liberal secularization of the 17th century Puritan, unchristian libido dominandi for achieving existential security by drawing transcendence into imminence to transform all experience into proofs of divine election. Hobbes likewise saw the destructive wars which followed the Reformation as driven by the Puritan drive to possess certainty of God's favor. Exactly. But the classical liberals merely posited a secular, artificial order to achieve a different ideal. For this reason, Vogelin struck at the source of these modern movements, labeling the Protestant Reformation as the Gnostic Revolution for its rejection of the spiritual authority of Catholicism and the objective Lex Rationis natural law proposed by it in favor of definite quasi-secular states, territorial monopolists of judicial and legislative power. Vogelin asserts that the entire Reformation movement and the whole of modernity must be understood as the successful invasion of Western institutions by Gnostic movements. Yes, the Reformation was a Gnostic revolution. Think about that. Ultimately, we find the Gnostic denial of free will at the heart of Calvinism. For both Luther, an Augustinian friar, and Calvin, St. Augustine, was a strong influence. They seemed in this way to reach back to a solid figure, one who represented an earlier time of broadly defined doctrines, but far back enough to substitute the authority of the Pope with Roman statist public law thus preventing doctrinal anarchy, especially where the Trinity, baptism, and a few other crucial doctrines were concerned. Calvin taught that Augustine was, quote, the best and most faithful witness of all antiquity, unquote. However, Augustine downplayed free will and contemporaries such as St. Vincent of Larens recognized that this was not in keeping with the universal tradition of the church but was rather a result of Augustine's Manichaean uh, and Platonist background. The great theological historian Henry Chadwick notes that the first instances of this denial indeed came from Gnosticism. Quote, the influence of fatalistic ideas drawn from popular astrology and magic became fused with notions derived from Pauline language about predestination to produce a rigidly deterministic scheme, unquote. Similarities to Kabbalism and Neoplatonism are apparent. Calvinism posits an elect predestined by God to receive inner enlightenment and be brought salvation through deterministic means rather than through the exercise of free will. As well as Bibles being produced in the common tongues, developments of the Gutenberg press and of a, pa a paper a century before allowed Calvin to write a 
quality standard Augustinian commentary, simple enough for the layman to understand, and providing national uniformity without recourse to popes or councils. It is hardly surprising that Vogelin refers to Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion as, quote, the first deliberately created Gnostic Quran, unquote. Moreover, emerging from this background, it is less surprising that hard determinism dominates modern academy, asserting it as it does, quote, the unbreakable sequence of cause and effect, the inevitable outcome of events going back to the Big Bang, unquote. This denial of free will is arguably the secularization of the Calvinist belief in the predestination of believers, in which free will is effectively denied in humans considered as slaves to their nature, the heathen, to this totally depraved nature, the Christian to the irresistible grace of God, which draws him closer. Barson makes the same argument, quote, modern criminology is rooted in this conviction and public opinion in the main agrees. The criminal is not responsible for his acts. He is conditioned, quote unquote, grace, the right heredity or environment has been denied him. Oh my God, that's so true. Look at the George Soros district attorneys that are currently letting murderers out of prison. It's the same idea. Oh, he couldn't help it. Oh, he was a good boy. He didn't do nothing wrong. He just made a mistake. You know what I'm saying? Further highlighting the deterministic zeitgeist shared by the secular elites of the modern period and popular Calvinism, Barzin conveys the changing temperament regarding free will with the example of the late 18th century Prussian king Frederick the Great, who outgrew his Calvinist upbringing but remained a fierce determinist. Barzin describes the common sense of being driven by a power not ourselves among great doers and creators, the tide in the affairs of men in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. This is, of course, the Gnostic temperament of a destined elite present among the Machiavellian opportunists, as well as in the most widely held Protestant dogma. In this way, we might rather describe the libido dominandi as the politicized Western Gnostic doctrine of a guiding, knowledgeable elite present across the spectrum of the bourgeoisie. It is tempting to retrospectively apply today's sociological data, which concludes that politicians are more likely than people in the general population to be sociopaths. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or just outright psychopaths. Or indeed, that's by the way, that the study of that is called ponderology. Look up ponderology, this idea that psychopaths and sociopaths rise to political power and then they go about high, like, basically bringing in other people like themselves so that you create this top-down effect of psychopaths at the top running everything. Or indeed, the desire among many to have these personality types exercise power. It is sufficient to note that this adds weight to my hypothesis that modern statism is the manifest rejection of free will by those who prey on and take on the decision-making ability of others, and those who willingly relinquish this responsibility to the former. But to solidify my argument, we must answer the question, how did the Calvinist monarchical, monarchical nation states evolve into the much more secular modern liberal democracy? Hmm. We arrive at the modern state with a shift of jurisprudence from a focus on natural law to natural rights. There's a big difference here, guys. That is, from the rationally identified justice and natural order achieved by the respect of others' free will to an artificial order sustained by Hobbes' Leviathan state, which at least initially proposed to grant rights to its citizens in accordance with the rational principles of natural law, the eminently salvific Gnostic civil theology proposed by Hobbes. Yes, exactly. These are God-given rights. They're not given to you by the state. 
quote, rejected transcendence and permitted all citizens to have a relationship with the divine only through obedience to the terrifying absolute sovereign, the intracosmic mortal god who dictated the form of Christian worship compulsory for the whole society and prophylactically sealed off the Christian commonwealth against intrusions by transcendence. Through obedience to and the favor of the king, one could attain this desired certainty, whilst avoiding any nihilistic imminent fall into non-being through death. The logical conclusion to Hobbes' brutal view of man's state of nature. In this way, the spiritually ordering power of Armor Dei and anything resembling the abstract, transcendence-oriented Lex Rationis school of natural law was supplanted by the enjoyment of the mere natural right to physical self-preservation and a cosmos devoid of divine presence. In this modern context, established largely by Hobbes and Locke, politics is simply the managing of warring passions and ever more contractual rights, and the medieval mindset, which views no division between church and secular state, but rather a fraternity and common aim between members of a community, becomes totally alien. Locke also said that liberty meant basically do what thou will, which is fascinating. Being based on the Western Gnostic rejection of natural order, we can thus distinguish between a modern libertarianism built on Gnostic modernist conceptions of freedom within an artificial man-made order, and a Thomistic or medieval libertarianism built on free will and the adherence to the rational given natural order. Given the radical changes to the definition of liberal, terms such as classical liberalism are confusing and do not address differences between the two major schools of jurisprudence which have characterized Western civilization, natural law and legal positivism. Certainly not when our aim is to identify legal positivism as the jurisprudential manifestation of a Western Gnostic worldview. Seeing as Van Dunn's critique of legal positivism as the Gnostic base of modernism, which has come to dominate jurisprudence since the 20th century follows Vogelin's, it is worth applying Henry's clarification above and Hannah Arden's notable critique of Vogelin to Van Dunn also. The criticisms of Vogelin offered by Professor Eugene Webb in his article Vogelin's Gnosticism Reconsidered is somewhat redundant. Webb explains that Gnosticism as a term has become so problematic and complex in recent years, I hate the word problematic, please stop using this, that its use must at the very least undercut Vogelin's effort to trace a historical line of descent from ancient sources to the modern phenomena he tried to use them to illuminate. In the first instance, I do not think that a genealogy of Gnosticism is necessitated by Vogelin's theory, nor does this have any relevance to Van Dunn's tracing legal positivism back to Western Gnosticism. Secondly, as we have seen, the scholarship of Western esotericism and Gnosticism has developed considerably, and we have a sound framework in which to study the general movement as a whole. Let us begin, therefore, with the major and far more pertinent debate between Vogelin and Arden. Arden's assessment of the causal factors for the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century comports in many ways with Vogelin's. She states, the tribal nationalism of the pan movements following the Protestant Reformation offered a new religious theory and a new concept of holiness. Contrary to Vogelin's view of the general libido dominandi of European modernism as the manifestation of positivistic Western Gnosticism, however, Arden understood it as a precise perversion of the Jewish doctrine of chosenness. <laughs> yeah. Arden frames much of nation statism as undergirded by the fear that it might the fear that it actually might be Jews, to whom success was granted by divine providence, a feeble minded resentment against a people who were guaranteed to em emerge eventually, and in spite of appearances as the final victors in world history, this being the Jewish mission in history to achieve the establishment of mankind, their own <laughs> uh, will to power and insanity, 
to unite humanity under the true God. Thus, the various national and religious wars of the past 500 years can be viewed as a competition, especially with the Jews, for worldly success as a manifestation of God's favor and thus confirmation of their chosenness. Boom! It explains a lot, folks. Chosenness special boy syndrome, was no longer the myth for an ultimate realization of the Jewish ideal of a common humanity, coexist, but had been co-opted for destructive ends, according to Ardent. It is important to note that, as a Jewess, Ardent noticeably plays up the claim of the Jews, affirming that they already possessed from beyond recorded history the very qualities violently striven for by the nation-states of Europe, leading, of course, to such pseudo-mystical movements as British Israelism <laughs> or Arianism's paleontological assumptions. Arden's own underlying positivism becomes most visible, however, in her view of European totalitarianisms as merely experiments, quote-unquote, the only limitation of which being the requirement of global control in order to show conclusive results regarding their ability to manipulate the nature of man. At this, Vogelin rightly identified Ardent as stuck in exactly the same imminent Gnostic paradigm he'd outlined, this is hardly surprising, given the Gnosticizing of Judaism which occurred during its modernization, not to mention the correlation between the broadly Semitic view of God and Western Gnosticism discussed above. Let us digress briefly into the modern Jewish mission for the unity of mankind, yeah, and development upon the distinction between the Semitic view of God and the traditional Catholic one, as this will highlight the Gnostic tendencies in modern Judaism and help explain Arden's unwitting display of these same tendencies. Yeah, it's called Tikkun Olam. Rabbi Lord Emmanuel Jacob, uh, Jacobitz, former uh, chief rabbi of the United Synagogue of Great Britain, is understandably the most frequently quoted authority when it comes to the modern Jewish understanding of their chosenness. Quote, Maybe the Greeks were chosen for their, un their unique contributions to art and philosophy, the Romans for their pioneering services in law and government, the British for bringing parliamentarian rule into the world, and the Americans for piloting democracy in a pluralistic society. The Jews were chosen by God to be particular unto me as the pioneers of religion and morality that was and is their natural purpose. But the context of this quote is not so well known. The particularly Semitic nature of Jacobit's God, so alike Occam's nominalist view, is outlined in clear, in clear contradistinction to, for instance, the traditional Catholic view. Quote, if ethical laws were good, immutable, and divine, because their virtue is manifest to reason, intuition, conscious, or any other human faculty, the whole structure of Judaism as a revealed religion would collapse. Judaism stands or falls by the uh, heteronomy of the law. This above view, uh, the above views are also shared by conservative and reformed Judaism. Notice this is very much in line with denials of eternal law and natural order of the world as identified by Vogelin as typical of Western Gnosticism. Pertinent to our dis discussion is Oakley's analysis of Occam, which agrees that legal positivism is a logical conclusion of the nominalist view of God. Quote, now, the lesson to be drawn is that in a coherent philosophical system, given any one of the following elements, we should expect to find, in conjunction with the rest, a nominalist epistemology, an empiricist approach to natural science, and, if a conception of God is admitted, a voluntarist or imposed version of the natural law, both scientific and judicial, and a Semitic view of God which stresses above all his utter freedom and omnipotence. But the voluntarist interpretation of the natural law tends to carry over into a positivist interpretation of law in general. The reason for this distinction of a Semitic view of God is that in Christianity, there was a baptism of the Platonic doctrine of eternal forms or ideas by means of the location of these ideas in the divine mind as exemplars according to which God created the world. The intellectualism, sometimes referred to as rationalism, of Aquinas stood against the voluntarism of Occam and other notable scholars of the time, such as Duns Scotus. 
uh, as occurred also in medieval Judaism and Islam. There was a fearful reaction against this in which the Bishop of Paris and the Archbishop of Canterbury condemned several Thomistic propositions of the 13th century. They were following the same thinking as the Arab and Jewish theologians who were grappling with Aristotle and the compatibility of free will and human reason with the omnipotence and omniscience of God. Uh, the Islamic uh, Mutzalites, for instance, believed God is reason and that God's laws are laws of nature, thus the similarities of Sharia to natural law. Prominent Muslim scholars of the period, such as Avors and Avincienna, owe much to Aquinas. During the Golden Age of Islam, under the liberal uh, Abbasid Caliphate, Persian philosophers were able to pick up where the Greeks left off, coming as close to developing the scientific method as any other civilization has ever come, and writing critically of the Quran. This was ended, however, by Grand Vizier Nizam al-Mulk, who imposed systems of education based on the Quranic understanding of the natural world. In this environment, the 11th century voluntarist scholar uh, Hamid al-Ghazali would become arguably the most influential Muslim since Muhammad by rejecting Greek philosophy outright. God was not bound by what we perceive as the rational order. Things do not act according to their own natures, but only according to God's will at the moment. Al-Ghazali's The Incoherence of Philosophers <laughs> was deemed to lay all opposition to rest. The influence of uh, Al-Ghazali on medieval Jewish thought is evident in Judah HaLevi, quote, I consider him to have attained the highest degree of perfection who is convinced of religious truths without having scrutinized them and reasoned over them. It is quite true that until the wider spread of Kabbalistic ideas in the 14th and 15th centuries, Judaism was more intellectualist and in accepting a strict conception of the natural order of the world from around the 10th century as evidenced by Sadia Gaon's division of the commandments of the Torah into those discoverable through reason and those positively imposed by God, as detailed by Professor Jacob Joshua Ross. But the primary sources contributed nothing as significant as Aquinas and are confusing. Academic sources differ as to when and how voluntarism emerged in Judaism. Ross sees it as emerging with the modernization of Judaism through the influence of Kabbalism, the door having been opened by semi-voluntarism of the Maharal of Prague, whereas Professor Len Evan Goodman would describe the highly influential 12th century Maimonides as a voluntarist. For our purposes, the link between Oakley's broad description of the Semitic view of God as opposed to the more Hellenistic Christian view is very much linked with the rise of voluntarism in general and was kept at bay in the Christian world by intellectualism. The Thomas philosopher Jacques Maritian summarizes the Thomistic position in such a way as to distinguish it from the voluntarism of Islam on the one hand and the Nesitarian views of Aristotle, precisely what the medieval voluntarists were trying to do. Quote, the most essential and the dearest aim of Thomism is to make sure that the personal contact of all intellectual creatures with God, as well as their personal subordination to God, be in no way interrupted. Everything else, the whole universe and every social institution, must ultimately minister to this purpose. Everything must foster and strengthen and protect the conversation of the soul, every soul with God. It is characteristically Greek and pagan to interpose the universe between God and intellectual creatures. Providence asserts that intellectual creatures made in the image of God, who is intellect, are alone willed for their own sake quite aside from the existence of the rest of the physical universe. So we might assert that Gnostic tendencies in the political as well as the theological share their roots with Jewish voluntarism, further cementing the Jewish doctrine of chosenness as exemplary of Western Gnostic traits. Another leader of modern Orthodox Judaism, Rabbi Norman Lamb, breaks down its tenets thus, quote, the spiritual vocation consists of two complementary functions described as goy kadosh, <laughs> that of a holy nation, and mom leket uh, kohenim, that of a kingdom of priests. 
Yeah, that sounds lovely. The first term denotes the development of communal separateness or differences in order to achieve a collective self-transcendence. The second term implies the obligation of this brotherhood of the spiritual elite toward the rest of mankind. Despite the Hellenistic influence on classical Judaism resulting in the firm belief in free will from at least the first century on, it seems unlikely one could find a better example of Oakland's two characteristics of the Gnostic than modern Judaism, an alienated spiritual elite who believe they have a divine mission to model the ideal as laid out by a positivistic deity. This is far from a spurious observation on my part. As a pertinent contemporary example, uh, Count Richard von uh, Kodenhoff Kalergi, whose own pan-European Union and various other ideas were primary precursors to the European Union, fetishized the future of demographic replacement in Europe and the development of a brown slave race with the Jews leading as a spiritual aristocracy. Notice also the typical deterministic language of Western Gnosticism in his writing, quote, The man of the future will be of mixed race. Today's races and classes will gradually disappear owing to the vanishing of space, time, and prejudice. The Eurasian, I can't say this word on YouTube, race of the future, similar in its appearance to the ancient Egyptians, will replace the diversity of peoples with a diversity of individuals. Oh, atomization. Instead of destroying European Jewry, Europe, against its own will, refined and educated this people into a future leader nation through this artificial selection process. No wonder that this people that escaped ghetto prison developed into a spiritual nobility of Europe. Therefore, a gracious providence provided Europe with a new race of nobility by the grace of spirit. This happened at the moment when Europe's feudal aristocracy became dilapidated, and thanks to Jewish emancipation. Likewise, certain modern Jews have taken up this particularly Gnostic interpretation of their chosenness, such as Barbara Lerner Spector in her Europe, Education of Adult Jewish Leaders in a Pan-European Perspective. To conclude this point, having fled 1930s Germany, it is improbable that Arden's somewhat myopic reaction would not have been colored by this, her ethno-cultural background. By suggesting these influence on Arden's perception as Vogelin himself did, my intention is not to argue ad hominem, but to avoid simply labeling her a hypocrite, for one could equally reverse her argument and cherry-pick historical data to suggest that the Jewish mission to unite mankind was a fearful reaction or feeble-minded resentment of Christ and the Church, who have, in fact, led the various nations of, a wor of the world to accept the one true God. Such an argument would be just as unhelpful, unscholarly, and more to the point elitist. We must simply state Vogelin's assessment of Arden was most likely accurate, and his counter-criticism should be commanded, uh, commended for remaining objective despite being most likely Jewish himself and facing similar circumstances to Arden. That aside, Arden's analysis of totalitarianism being built on a religious quest for manifestations of chosenness does not square with the historical data. As concisely laid out by Burzen here, quote, with the metamorphosis of king into monarch and into the realm of into nation, religion also shifted its position and culture. Laymen, as we saw, replaced clerics in government with the longing for a strong central power came out of weariness with the sectarian fighting. Religious faith as such did not weaken, but many saw its ideologies as interfering with governance. What weight, if any, should they have in the conduct of state affairs? A striking event gave one answer. In 1593, Henry, king of Nav, a Nevers and a Protestant was at war to make good his claim to the throne of France. He needed to win over the per Parisians, who were staunch Catholics. He gave up his Huguenot faith, saying Paris is well worth a mass. <laughs> Similarly, in about the same time, the future James I of England, a Protestant king of Scotland, was promising to turn Catholic if the leaders of that party would help him to secure the English throne. During the Thirty Years' War, Cardinal Richelieu, believing the national interest to lie on the Protestant side, allied himself to Luther in Sweden. Interesting indeed. Okay, so you can read the rest of this on your own. I think is very, very interesting. Um, and it it's just fascinating, really. So moving on uh, to 
this um, article from Post Liberal Order on Substack, which you can sign up for, by Patrick Deenan. Russia, America, and the Danger of Political Gnosticism, what Eric Vogelin can teach us about today's international crisis. I thought it was interesting because this is sort of um, current events tied into this, right? I have been teaching a seminar attended by a small number of seniors and graduate students titled Critics of Modernity. As we approach the halfway mark of the semester, we have thus far read selections from Leo Strauss, Hannah Arden, and Eric Vogelin, all German-born philosophers who fled Nazi Germany, eventually settling in the U.S. During their years of exile, the remainder of their lives, they became rightly renowned for their penetrating analysis on the deepest philosophic sources of the catastrophe of totalitarianism and remain major intellectual influences in the uh, pivotal field of political philosophy. It was pure serendipity that we were reading Vogelin's The New Science of Politics in the opening days of the war in Ukraine. Arguably, more than any of his contemporaries, Vogelin's analysis remains stunningly relevant and even prophetic in this moment. He provides an instructive set of categories by which to understand the current global situation. Um... Vogelin's thesis is rich but fairly straightforward. For those who haven't read him, here's a simplified summary. There have been three political theological stages or chapters in Western history. The first was the age of civil religion, when the gods existed in the servants of human cities and human allegiance to the gods was equal to allegiance to the city. Thus, those who questioned the gods or suggested alternatives were subject to civic censoring, the most infamous instance being the prosecution, condemnation, and execution of Socrates for, among other things, introducing new gods to the city. The second stage was the age of Christendom. Christianity represented a, quote, radical revolution, unquote, in the history of the world, teaching humans were citizens of two cities, the city of God and the city of man. Christians aspired to becoming full members of the city of God and thus understood that their citizenship in any earthly city was temporary and conditional. We were better understood to be pilgrims than love it or leave it citizens. Boglin called this the de-divination of earthly cities. Not that divinity ceased to exist, but God's existence was ultimately beyond and outside any earthly city. The, the third state developed as an outgrowth of the Christian Revolution. Immediately, along with what would become the Augustinian Christianity, there arose a number of heresies, most importantly, in Vogelin's view, Gnosticism. Gnosticism was the belief that the world was a fallen and imperfect place, which is true, but that humans, equipped with a form of divine knowledge, or gnosis, could transcend these imperfections, achieving through gnosis a perfected existence outside and beyond the fallen world. Um, what, ye shall uh, eat of the fruit of knowledge, and ye shall become as God? Your eyes will be opened. <laughs> That's like literally what it is. Vogelin argued modern um, Gnosticism was an effort to redivinize the political world, not now by bringing the gods into the service of the city, but by making the city into a heaven on earth. Utopianism. Vogelin saw the rise of totalitarianism as a potent form of fully political Gnosticism, where the belief in human perfectibility through politics in the form of fascism and Marxism, aligned against the still extant forms of Christendom that he saw especially vital in the U.S. and Great Britain. Russia. At several points in the latter part of the New Science of Politics, Vogelin touches on the subject of Russia. Russia, he argues, arose as a particular form of civil religion, phase one of Western history. In contrast to the Augustinian West, the Catholic world, he argued that the situation in the East was different. Even though Christian, it was a Christianity that retained the pagan, specifically Roman, form of civil religion. Vogelin writes, in the East developed by the Byzantine form of Caesaropapism in direct continuity with the position of the emperor in pagan Rome. Constantinople was the second Rome after the fall of Can Constantinople to the Turks. The idea of Moscow as the successor to the Orthodox Empire gained ground in Russian circles. Vogelin quotes from a letter 
uh, from Philippi of Sakoff to Ivan the Great, quote, Know you, O pious Tsar, that all empires of the Orthodox Christians have converged into thine own. You are the sole autocrat of the universe, the only Tsar of all Christians. According to the prophetic books, all Christian empires have an end and will converge into one empire, that of our Gosudar, that is, into the empire of Russia. Two Romes have fallen, but the third will last and there will not be a fourth one. Boglin concludes his discussion of Russia as the new final form of Christianized civil religion with these sentences. Transcendentally, Russia was distinguished from all Western nations as the imperial representative of Christian truth and through her social rearticulation from which the Tsar emerged as the existential representative, she was radically cut off from the development of representative institutions in the sense of the Western national states. Napoleon finally recognized the Russian problem when in 1802 he said that there were only two nations in the world, Russia and the Occident. Later in the book, Boglin returns to a discussion of Russia, having noted that communism is a modern form of political Gnosticism. He nevertheless discerns that the communist mission of Russia was, in some fundamental respects, simply an overlay on the more foundational civil religion of ancient Russia. Take away the Gnosticism of communism, which he thought was a possibility, and indeed, that the West should pursue victory against modern Gnosticism. Nevertheless, he argued Russia would remain distinct from the Augustinian West for deeper theopolitical reasons. Russia was still um, most foundationally a nation forged in the theology of the ancient form of civil religion. That the Soviet Union is an expanding great power on the continent has nothing to do with communism. The present extension of the Soviet Empire over the satellite nations corresponds substantially to the program of the Slavic Empire under Russian hegemony as it was submitted, for instance, by Bukhanin to Nicholas I. It is quite conceivable that a non-communist Rus Russian hegemonic empire would today have the same expanse and be a greater danger because it would be better consolidated. Interesting. Perhaps for readers at the time, and even until just a few days ago, the importance of Vogelin's claims were not readily evident. He argues that at that time it was imperative for the Augustinian West to combat political Gnosticism in the form of communism. However, even were, Soviet com even were Soviet communism defeated, the Russian roots in a more modern form of civil religion would remain. It would need to be combated, but on a different footing and understanding. And then he gets to America. Boglin's analysis doesn't simply point to the totalitarian political utopias of the middle part of the 20th century as the sole forms of political Gnosticism. He points as well to the presence of Gnosticism in the liberal democracies of the West. In significant part, his book is a polemic not so much against totalitarian communism, but the tendencies of liberalism to develop its own potent forms of Gnosticism. He sees this as inherent feature of modern liberalism to the extent that it is drawn to several commitments that tend toward Gnosticism. Those features are not limited to, but centrally include an affinity to theories of progress, particularly through the form of applied scientism. Vogelin wrote, with the prodigious announcement of science since the 17th century, the new instrument of cognition would become, one is inclined to say, inevitably, the symbolic vehicle of Gnostic truth and the Gnostic speculation of scientism. This particular variant replaced the era of Christ by the era of Comte. Scientism has remained, to this day, one of the strongest Gnostic movements in Western society, and the uh, imminentist pride in science is so strong that even the special sciences have left a distinguishable sediment in the variants of salvation. Western liberal democracies were no less susceptible to the tendency toward Gnosticism and their more radical counterparts in Germany and Russia, but rather than making an appearance in a revolutionary form, the Gnosticism was more likely to develop out of a reformist, what he called right Gnosticism, or more clearly, the progressive left. Right Gnosticism, or leftism, would appear as reformist impulse within liberalism, but would gravitate in the direction of a more radical messianic Gnosticism over time. 
At the time Vogelin was writing, he believed one found in the U.S. and Britain in particular that there was a balance, quote-unquote, between the social forces of Augustinian Christianity and political Gnosticism. However, he believed or feared that an internal tendency within liberalism tilted toward a more revolutionary form of Gnosticism. The left, which had the power of scientism and ideological progressivism behind it, held out the hope that the partial revolutions of the past will be followed by the radical revolution for the establishment of the final realm. A hope that rests on the assumptions that the traditions of Western society are now sufficiently ruined. The experience of the past several decades have only confirmed Vogelin's fear and warning. What was once a reformist left is today a radicalized messianic party advancing its Gnostic vision amid the ruins of the Christian civilization that once balanced these forces. What we today call woke is merely a new articulation of the revolutionary dream that was once vested in communism. The examples are legion, the wholesale transformation, and even elimination of the traditional, i.e. natural family. The effort to define sexuality according to human desire aided by technological interventions. Yeah, like surgeries, um, puberty blockers, etc. An understanding of crime solely as a function of the social order, the disdain toward those who work in non-Gnostic areas of life, the working class, the effort to impose biopolitical dominion over all human life during the suddenly irrelevant crises of the pandemic was but an extension of this deeply Gnostic impulse, the belief that the physical world was abhorrent, that we could, through masking, distancing, and enforced medical intervention, eliminate risk of disease and death. All the while, these various mandates followed the trajectory of a raft of other economic and social policies that led to the empowerment of a disembodied laptop class, <laughs> or what N.S. Lyons has dubbed the virtuals at the expense of the working class or the physicals, quote unquote. The decades following America's victory in the Cold War was a perfectly scripted expression of Gnostic belief in power. Ironically, the Pyrrhic laugh of a classical and Christian civilization that was enjoying the fruits of victory over its Gnostic foe. America and Russia Today Grasping Vogelin's analysis, we can now ask, where in, in the contemporary age do we witness the greatest danger of utopian Gnosticism? Where are its dynamics most on display as a new revolutionary ideology? At the time of the publication of Vogelin's book, The Great Threat, uh, the threat of Gnosticism appeared primarily to emanate from the Soviet Union. However, a careful reading of his book suggests that political Gnosticism was never the essence of Russia but a temporary trapping of its more fundamental form of civil religion. Rather, Vogelin's argument pointed to the West itself, the formerly Augustinian Christian nations of Europe, England, and America, as particularly susceptible to the move from reformist Gnosticism, the liberal left, to messianic political Gnosticism. Today, it should be clear, even to casual observers, that Vogelin's fears have come true. The progressive ruling class that populates and runs the main institutions of America, American and European society are now the most thoroughgoing and ideological exemplars of political Gnosticism. Their relentless efforts to exurpate any remnant of the predecessor classical and Christian society is daily on display. As Vogelin observed, Gnostics necessarily become the most vocal anti-Christians, rightly detecting that they are the greatest threat to the redivination of the political order. Those who bear the stamp of that belief in significant part in deference to the limits and realities of the created order become marked as domestic enemies. Hmm. A generation ago, Vogelin admired American and British opposition to the political Gnosticism of the Soviet Union. Today, we again see the U.S. and West united in opposition to Russia. However, the dynamics have changed considerably, considering that it is today the West is dominantly led by the new political Gnostics. The Gnosticism of the elites blinds them to the actual dynamics of what is unfolding, as it blinded them previously to facts about COVID and the underlying dynamics that gave rise to Brexit and Donald Trump. 
a feature of political Gnosticism is the insistent denial of reality, history, and limits. <laughs> As Vokland described Gnostics, they are marked by, quote, disregard for the structure of reality, ignorance of facts, fallacious misconstruction and falsification of history, irresponsible opining on the, on the basis of sincere conviction, philosophical illiteracy, spiritual dullness, and agnostic sophistication, unquote, based. <laughs> These features are on vivid display today as we witness the rise of moralistic and sentimental condemnation or sympathy, depending on which side they are cheering for or against, whether it's against anyone who voted for Trump, racist, anyone who refused to wear a mask or get a booster, murderer, anyone who honked horns against the new biopolitical regime, again, racist or maybe fascist, anyone who attempts a sober assessment of the causes of and cautions to be drawn from the war that don't simply devolve into simplistic posturing, fascist. We see in the current reporting on Ukraine these qualities on full display as they were during the suddenly irrelevant pandemic. The invention of approved narratives, the erasure of history, the denial of context, and the barring of considerations of complex and complicating factors. For those who've been paying close attention, Ukraine, tragically, has been a pawn of American Gnostic dynamics. Many sober voices warned that an expansion of NATO to Russia's border would poke the bear, leading to an inevitable war. As long ago as 1998, following the U.S. decision to expand NATO eastwards, George Kennan said the following to Thomas Friedman, quote, I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. Nobody was threatening anybody else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. We have signed up to uh, protect a whole series of countries, even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. NATO expansion was simply a lighthearted action by a Senate that has no real interest in foreign affairs. What bothers me is how superficial and ill-formed the whole Senate debate was. I was particularly bothered by the references to Russia as a country dying to attack Western Europe. The hubristic expansionism on display, heedless of victory, geography, culture, and political realism, has become a hallmark of liberal Gnosticism, the feverish faith that nothing can nor should stand in the way in the end of history. All corners of the world must be remade in the image of liberal Gnosticism, whether the globe, your classroom, your workplace, your church, or your very biology. And what has unfolded during the past week, the war over Ukraine continues to serve the Gnostic ambitions of America's political classes. One can and must lament the tragedies befalling the people of Ukraine and ordinary Russians. We can and ought to call out the aggression by Russia. We can do so without averting our eyes from the deeper and longer set of historical, philosophical, and theological forces at play that have set this course of events into motion and which call for prudence and humility rather than Gnostic certainty. The Gnostic left revolutionary Gnosticism rightly sees Russia as the theopolitical competitor. It is the opposite form of divination, an echo of the Roman Empire formed in the image and likeness of a pre-Christian Roman civil religion. It is confronted by an aggressive opponent, the political Gnosticism of imperial liberalism. The fervency of the left opposition to Russia invasion is driven by a religious zeal because Russia is a civilizational opponent to Gnostic universalism. The lust to destroy existing Russia, to engage in regime change, or even wager that a victory is possible in a nuclear war, reflects a deeply Gnostic dream of remaking the world in the image of a universalized heaven on earth. The war fervency of the conservative ruling class burns no less intensely. Their muscle memory tells them that American opposition to Russia takes the same form described by Vogelin, the Augustinian Christian opposition to Soviet political Gnosticism. Yet today, the old and new neocons are the newest incarnation of right Gnostics, right liberals, who are comfortable with a slower liberal revolution. 
yet always listing leftward in their accommodation to the quote-unquote blessings of liberty. They are the pawns of the messianic Gnostics, no less so than Ukraine has been the pawn of the whole rotten ruling class. The response of both the left and right Gnostics to those who warn of the imprudence of actions that would trigger a World War III fought with nuclear weapons and who call for recognition of the role the West has played in this current crisis and thus which bears responsibility not to exacerbate it is characteristically to accuse their opponents of sympathizing with Putin or outright fascism. Here again, Vogelin captured this feature of Gnostic mentality the interpretations of moral insanity as morality and the virtues of Sophia and Prudentia as immorality is a confusion difficult to unravel, and the task is not facilitated by the readiness of the dreamers to stigmatize the attempt at critical clarification as an immoral enterprise. As a matter of fact, every great political thinker who recognized the structure of reality from Machiavelli to the present has been branded an immoralist by Gnostic intellectuals to say nothing of the parlor game so much beloved among liberals of panning Plato and Aristotle as fascists. Caught between the political Gnostics and the modern nationalist civil religion is the remnant of the Augustinian Christians. Once significant enough in Vogelin's view to balance the Gnostics in the West, today they have been all but routed as Vogelin feared the traditions of Western society are now sufficiently ruined. In the main, they oppose the reckless course being urged on by the ruling class to assert American hegemony over a part of the world that has a complex history in which we do not adequately understand. While this opposition to war with Russia is interpreted merely as displaying an underlying sympathy toward Putin and his vision of an authoritarian Russia, such critics are incapable of understanding the foundational differences between Catholic Christianity and any national conservatism premised on a civil religion. It's not sympathy with Russia that motivates this opposition, though it is a call to more self-reflection, but rather a deeper concern for the fate of the West. If our countrymen and children will be asked by the laptop class to fight and die mostly for them, we rightly ask, for what are they to die? Is it the classical and Christian civilization, the fought and defeated fascism and communism, or is it on behalf of a successor philosophy, a toxic liberalism that today drapes itself in Ukrainian flags but will tomorrow denounce the very idea of the nation, particular cultures, and Christianity, discarding Ukraine's view and blue and yellow for a rainbow flag and turning on the Ukrainian churches in whose crypts its people are sheltering? Whether we have the sobriety to avoid what is becoming the deafening drums of war and the ability to recognize that Gnostic dreams must always confront reality, too often brutally, the deeper the denial becomes hinges on whether there is enough of a remnant of the Augustinian civilization that Vogelin once believed was sufficient to balance our Gnostic illusions and instead to recognize the signs of the time. I thought that was interesting. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And then finally, liberalism is Gnosticism, a response to Keith Woods. Keith Woods argues liberalism is just materialism without metaphysical or teleological beliefs. Rather, liberalism is a form of spiritual egoism and a form of Gnosticism. I thought this was pretty interesting. Recently, I had a slight disagreement with one of the most interesting thinkers on YouTube, Keith Woods. It was an amicable chat about an article I wrote for Arctos Journal a few years ago titled Modern Statism as Western Gnosticism. In it, I brought together scholarship from numerous fields to synthesize the idea that modern liberalism is simply a recurrence or sect of age-old Gnosticism. As Keith notes, I am far from the first to observe this, and I am in great company. I can understand why Keith is frustrated. Top thinkers close to him, such as Professor Edward Dutton and others who have influenced his thought, such as Paul Gottfried, are largely in agreement with me. Of course, this is not to say that this theory is true because men smarter than Keith or me have concluded thus. Rather, I am surprised that, given Keith's consistently excellent research, he would mischaracterize the opposing position with his video response title is the left agnostic death cult. 
I can't think of any notable figure who has taken the step to saying that liberalism, quo Gnosticism, is a death cult. I have. Nevertheless, Keith makes some really interesting points in the video, and so I will chalk the misleading title up to youthful post ironic humor. You will see this article is brief, and that's because Keith has two or three simple misunderstandings about the liberalism is Gnosticism position. These are that liberalism is materialism, has no metaphysical beliefs, and therefore is not a religion, that Gnosticism does not include or account for the mindlessly hedonistic masses of liberalism because Gnosticism is supposed to hate the material world, and that liberalism, even progressivism, does not have a teleology per se, that is, a belief in some transcendent and objective end to man. Let us address each of these points. Are today's liberals faithless materialists? Certainly, moderns reduce almost everything to the material. They immunitize the eschaton, as Eric Boglin famously put it, and they establish the reign of quantity, as René Guénon put it. This does not discount the metaphysical assumptions they make about their ego. Indeed, most are still comfortable to call this their soul or spirit. In truth, for the liberal, all is reduced to egoism, not necessarily materialism. Simply consider the typical woke, agnostic term, if I ever heard one, liberal of today. They insist that they have their own truth. <laughs> My truth! Something that can be true for them, and the exact opposite can be true for another. If I declare that I am a banana, and you are charitable enough to challenge me on the objective facts, and if you dare try to limit my inner will, my most inner will, with data from the natural world and order, then you have apparently committed violence and are quote-unquote literally Hitler. The reason for this is they believe their ego is something separate from their physical body. They can be a woman or even an animal trapped in a man's body. Contra skepticism, they believe that in this ever-changing world of flux, their ego can posit truth. Indeed, such is the primacy of the liberal's ego that they will use political force to uphold subjective truth of their will over and in defiance of the physical constraints of the material world. They would be the voluntaristic god of their own universe. To repeat, liberalism is spiritual egoism, not necessarily materialism. If liberals really believe that we are our brains, then they would not strive for their immaterial ego to be deemed totally separate from the body. The whole idea of the singularity and transhumanist dreams of the mind meaningfully existing, separate from embodiment, would be laughed to scorn. On the contrary, it is frequently popularized in science fiction. In short, the Gnostic liberals actually have transcendent metaphysical beliefs about the ego, the soul, whether they will consistently acknowledge this or not. What of hedonistic lovers of this world? The brilliant Ken Wilbur observed that philosophies and religions are either ascenders pointing upward toward the one, the eternal, or they are descenders pointing downward toward the many, the temporal world of matter. Christianity fascinatingly does both, but I won't digress. Keith queries where the hedonistic descenders fit into modern Western Gnosticism. As Keith notes, in certain ancient Gnostic sets, there were three spiritual classes with the hylix at the bottom. These descenders were basically soulless animals who could only desire material things, never spiritual things. I could simply argue that maybe the liberal elites consider most of the masses as soulless cattle who only deserve to own nothing, live in pods, eat the bugs, and plug into the pleasure box. They become tools to serve the elite's ends, as does all of material nature. None of this precludes a Gnostic framework. However, it isn't even necessary to make that argument. Not all Gnosticism is monkish asceticism. There were always schools of Gnostic libertinism, those who indulged in sin and believed that this had no bearing on their egoistic soul. Either they believed that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, or they even indulged believing that the evil material world with its supposed moral laws was created by an evil emanation and not the one true god of the Platonists and Christians flouting the moral law could sometimes be encouraged. Gnostic libertinism thus spans the whole scale from the negative license to positive Faustian obligation. 
Keith contends that public intellectuals like Yuval Noah Harari are not interested in the spiritual transcendence of the masses, but want us docile, drugged, and distracted with bread and circuses, whilst the elite keep the population figures down. But this is ignoring the fact that the masses are trusting the science, putting their faith in these Gnostic elites with their might-as-well-be-secret gnosis of scientific knowledge. Just look at how religiously trusting the masses of the world have been to the scientific advisors of their political classes, especially during the worldwide COVID lockdowns, believing they will deliver them from death. Gnosticism has always had its trusted elites to guide initiates in such revolts against the natural order. The argument really boils down to this question. Aren't Gnostics supposed to hate the material world? Surely they would not want eternal life in the material world, certainly not living in a computer. Gnostics should want eternal transcendence, not eternal imminence in the world. Aren't they all just materialistic descenders? But are the elites necessarily encouraging the masses to be more attached to material things? Are we the consumers actually becoming more attached to material things in the natural world? As Professor William T. Kavanaugh has observed in Being Consumed, we aren't becoming more attached to material things. Rather, we cannot care less what they're made of or how disposable they are, nor are we becoming more attached to the natural world. We love to be thought of as caring for the planet but we urbanites know nothing of it. We know we would not last five minutes fending for ourselves. Material goods in the natural world are not as important to us as the flattery of our ego and the promise of escaping death. It's not that we can't leave the cities, we just don't want to. We are increasingly seeking out virtual experiences rather than the real thing. This rebellion against nature and the imagined triumph of one's will over it is Gnosticism. Trends such as gender reassignment are demonstrably ancient examples of it. And he has this interesting picture here, the androgyny. That is from medieval times. The teleology of transhumanism. The Gnostic liberals do have a teleology, an end for human existence. It is the mastery of nature. Again, this belief is transcendent and makes metaphysical assumptions about the mind, destiny, etc. Whether the liberal realizes they are engaging in metaphysics or not, transhumanists believe that we can and will escape the shackles of this material body and thus escape death, preserving our souls and transcending to create our own meta-worlds, not just augmenting this reality, but subordinating the resources and tools of the modern world to our own virtual worlds, not storming heaven, but inventing our own as gods. In such worlds, we would no longer be subject to the pleasures and pains of this world, but would command all things at will, a will freed from the constraints of the body and the natural world. Now, I am, of course, not saying I believe this is good or even possible, but they believe it. And such a belief is unmistakably a sect of Gnosticism, claiming that this is not real Gnosticism because the Gnostic self-made heaven is not the real heaven is more indicative of Keith's beliefs than it is the Gnostic, the egoistic Gnostics. As the influential John Gray, who is an atheist, aptly observed in The Soul of the Marionette, the Gnostic faith that knowledge can give humans a freedom no other creature can possess has become the predominant religion. Believing that human beings can be fully understood in terms of scientific materialism, they reject any idea of free will, but they cannot give up hope of being masters of their destiny. So they have come to believe science will somehow enable the human mind to escape the limitations that shape its natural condition. So we have seen that liberalism is not materialism, it is spiritual egoism, as it makes metaphysical assumptions about the ego. Liberals aren't becoming increasingly attached, but rather detached from the material world. And liberalism believes in the teleology of scientific progress to free the ego from the body in order to master the material world. Now, none of this addresses all of the arguments for modern liberalism being Gnosticism in my original article, so I advise you to read that if you'd like to learn more. Regardless, I might be wrong about all of this. If Keith could overturn this conversation and convince us all of our error, I'd be grateful and very pleased for him.
Instead, a much more significant conversation I think we should be having on the right is that of individualism versus corporatism, understanding how successful human groups grow and behave, and understanding how individualism can destabilize and kill the body politic. Too many on the right are still hung up on individualistic religious and political ideas to our detriment, and this urgently needs addressing. If liberalism is Gnostic, it is egoistic, spiritually individualist sect of Gnosticism, and therein lies the problem. Indeed, I think that that is interesting, and I think it makes sense. Um, <laughs> here's some Gnostic symbolism, just to give you an idea. <laughs> yeah, that's William Blake's depiction of Lucifer before the fall as an androgynous being. So I thought that was very interesting. I think that there are a lot of good points here about um, leftism being Gnosticism and political Gnosticism being something that is not just a leftist phenomenon, but that the right has its own version of it, I think makes a lot of sense.